This meeting is being recorded. Fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, this is Steve Conklin, Dr. Cog Vice Chair. I call this meeting to order. Dr. Cog Board Work Session for Wednesday, March 2nd, 2022. Uh, and Melinda, you take attendance via the list of names on the, uh, on the Zoom, correct? That is correct. So with that, we will move to public comment. If there's public comment, we would request that there be no public comment on issues to which a prior public hearing has been held. Uh, before the Board of Directors. Do we have any public comment uh, this afternoon? I don't see any hands. Melinda, do you see any hands? Uh, I do not at this point in time. Fantastic, thank you. I will call attention to the fact there is a summary of November 3rd, 2021 board work session uh, in the packet. Uh, Melinda or Doug, did we need any discussion on that item or is that just informational for us? Just informational. Thank you very much. With that, we will move on to item number four. See, we're flying through the agenda. Uh, number four is a AAA funding overview and Jayla Sanchez Warren, Director of the Area Agency on Aging will kick off that conversation. Welcome Jayla. Thank you. Uh, is Sharon Day on? Not yet. She is. I'm working on uh, okay. getting her promoted. Um, okay. And a oh, quick thing. I just want to let everyone know who's new. Um, it will pop up when you're being promoted to panelists. You need to accept that so you can be moved over. So just wanted to throw out that quick disclaimer. Sorry, Jayla. That's okay. No problem. So I'm, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jayla Sanchez Warren. I'm the director of the Area Agency on Aging. You know, next month, April 1st, um, Dr. Cog will have been a uh, designated area agency on aging for 48 years. 48 years we've been the area agency on aging. Basically, our job is just to help people age better. And we do that in a variety of ways, right? We fund services, lots of services that you'll hear about later on tonight. We provide services. We do planning for today's needs as well as future needs. And we advocate on behalf, we are federally mandated to advocate on behalf of older adults and their caregivers. Um, I've worked for Dr. Cog for almost my entire life, 32 years. <laughs> and I, I wanna tell you the past two years have been the most challenging in the area agency on aging that I've ever had um, or ever seen. One, because the older population was hit so hard by COVID, uh, eight of the 10 deaths of, uh, from COVID were in people over 65. Um, the services and the capacity to serve changed rapidly and often. And we lost a lot of those people that helped us provide those services. Um, and we received more money than we've ever had in our my entire career. And that, well, can be a blessing is also a really big challenge. And um, Sharon Day is here, who is our program manager for um, the business operations, for the AAA business operations. She's gonna tell you about um, kind of uh, all the funding that we received, what we did with it. And then we're gonna, I'm gonna finish up with talking about some of the challenges that are ahead of us for the, the next couple of years. So Sharon? Yes, hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sharon Day, as Jayla mentioned. I'm actually having trouble opening my presentation right now because uh, it's, I guess, the size. So I'll just talk while I'm waiting for it to open up. Um, but my name is Sharon Day. I'm a program manager, business operations, supporting the Area Agency on Aging Division. And I've been with Dr. Cog for just over six and a half years. And my primary responsibility is over the AAA um, financial and contracting functions. And uh, that means working with all of the, the service contractors and just making sure that we're in compliance with all of our funding. And so um, uh, we were asked, Jayla and myself, to, to give you a bit of an overview of AAA funding in light of all of the ch changes that we've experienced over the last couple of years with the 
um, uh, COVID-19 federal stimulus funding that was received. So we're really going to um, be giving you kind of that general overview of these past few years and show you how those funds are allocated uh, by our different providers as well as by service and um, thoughts for the future as well. And it does look like my, um, my presentation did finally open up. So I shall share my screen. And uh, please let me know that you can see it and I will expand. Good. You can see it? Okay, great. Okay, so um, it's worth giving you some background about the AAA funding sources. So um, the, the AAA is, has, in my six and a half years, has grown quite significantly over um, that time period. And while um, it receives a, a variety of funding, you know, there's a Veterans Direct program through a, um, a contract with the VA, there's an Elder Refugee program and, and Hospital Transitions program. There's other other um, streams of funding, but Older Americans Act and its counter, its state counterpart, the Older Coloradans Act, are the pretty much 85% of the mix of funding that the AAA receives. And so the Federal Older Americans Act is, um, it was enacted back in the 1960s during the Johnson administration and is, was really intended to pay for um, uh, services that would enable older adults to live with dignity and independence. So essentially helping to pay for those services that would allow them to live in their community of choice. And so it, um, it has some specific services. The, the Older American, Federal Older Americans Act is broken out into different buckets, if you will, that are uh, for specific types of services. So for instance, there's a subportion specifically for nutrition services. So it pays for um, uh, the uh, home delivered meals. So meals on wheels, as well as for um, uh, meals in a congregate dining setting and nutrition counseling and education. There's a separate bucket specifically just for evidence-based health promotion and disease prevention programs. Um, there's an another bucket for family caregiver, um, programs that provide uh, caregiver um, counseling, education, um, assistance to uh, different um, access assistance to, to, to other uh, wraparound services. And then there's this other, other supportive services bucket that pays for uh, services that generally help to provide better access to services such as um, assisted transportation, information assistance, uh, legal assistance, and, and so forth. So uh, it is very prescriptive in what we could pay for. It all falls under that Title III section of Older Americans Act. Um, and there are certain mandates that go along with that. We have to abide by certain percentages, for instance, that we have to allocate for legal assistance, for instance. Um, ombudsman is another uh, mandated service, and that's what the Title VII portion pays for. So uh, we have a whole long-term care ombudsman team within Dr. Cog that goes out to the various uh, facilities um, and advocates for those residents. So um, that's the Federal Older Americans Act piece. It's really um, eligibility for services really based on age 60 and older uh, without a means test. And what that refers to is the fact that um, one's income is not a criteria for eligibility um, for receiving the service. However, because the funds are limited, uh, we do have to prioritize services for individuals who are of greatest economic and social need. Um, which really is, is sort of defined for us based on um, the Older Americans Act. So the, um, th these would be folks who, for instance, are socially isolated due to geographic reasons, like they live in a rural area with um, less access to service. They're, um, perhaps they uh, speak another, you know, English is not their primary language, and so there's a language barrier. Um, 
And economic need, of course, refers to the fact that they are um, living below the federal poverty line. Um, I guess homebound is another, another um, criteria for, for social need as well, if you're frail and homebound. Um, so anyway, those are really sort of the, the general rules of Older Americans Act. The uh, state counterpart, the Older Coloradans Act, is um, really follows the same uh, sort of parameters as Federal Older Americans Act um, without all of the, uh, the different buckets spelled out for us. So we have a little bit more flexibility with regard to the state portion. Um, the, those dollars, though, are are allocated to us uh, in, in the state fiscal year and must be used within that state fiscal year. So it's more or less use it or lose it. Um, and whereas with the federal portion, there is a small carryover provision uh, where we can, it's capped at 10% where we could potentially carry over some of that money into the next year. But all of this money comes to Dr. Cog through a, a contract that we have with the Department of Human Services, and it's distributed uh, via a funding formula. And that funding formula is really um, uh, dictated by the uh, kind of our proportion of the uh, pop population of 60 plus within the state. So Dr. Cog is one of 16 AAAs. Um, the AAA, Dr. Cog AAA, specifically is uh, is is eight counties so that's that was what we were designated to cover and so within those eight counties we have close to 50 percent of the state's population of 60 plus and so that's just to give you an idea of what proportion of that total federal and state funding that that dr cog might receive via the funding formula and then of course there's um i'll talk a bit as well about all of that federal COVID-19 stimulus money here in a bit. So you will see how that kind of plays into the overall mix of funding. This slide is really just the current um, pass-through budget for the AAA. Um, you'll see in this pie chart how those dollars are represented federal um, through the Older Americans Act, the state long bill, through the Older Coloradans Act, as well as all of that COVID-19 stimulus dollars. So it's roughly a third each. Um, prior to COVID, we would really have close to 50-50 for federal and state, but um, there's $34 million in total pass-through funds for the current uh, fiscal year. And as I mentioned before, we follow the, our funding is available to us in the state fiscal year. So that runs July 1st through June uh, 30th of 2022. And uh, included in that federal portion is um, $6 million of carryover. And it's worth noting that carryover because that is quite sizable for Dr. Cog. Normally it's, it's, it's a lot smaller because of that 10% cap on what can be carried over. Um, but uh, this particular year, uh, we, we state waived that 10% cap and um, allocated the, the $6 million of carryover to Dr. Cog. Um, it was, it's unusually high uh, because, um, and I'll talk, to you in a minute about all of the COVID-19 money. The COVID-19 money uh, was prioritized over state money and then federal was sort of the last thing that was prioritized for spending. And so um, the carryover was larger for, for, for this year and was only recently allocated to us in December of this year. In addition uh, to the mix is that um, roughly 9.3 million of COVID-19 stimulus funding of which uh, 7.9 million, we just, uh, it says pending, but when I, when, uh, since this presentation was put together, we actually did execute that contract. So in January, Dr. Cog received the 7.9 million from the American Rescue Plan Act, which is uh, what I'll refer to as the ARPA dollars. And just to give you perspective of what that $34 million looks like relative to previous years. So 2019 pre-pandemic, that was kind of, um, you'll see kind of that mix, that close to 50-50 mix of state and federal. 
Um, it was slightly leaning more towards the, the federal. But what's interesting to see in this bar chart, obviously it's, it's growing year over year, but you'll see the blue part, which represents the Federal Older Americans Act, that blue part has been roughly you know, stable. Um, ever since I've been with Dr. Cog, um, the federal portion has been uh, a reliable um, and sort of stable amount for, for the last, um, well, as long as I've <laughs> ever been with Dr. Cog. And then the state dollar, similarly, you can see that, that orange portion, that is the state long bill through the Older Coloradans Act. That money, if anything, has been slightly increasing due to the advocacy efforts of Dr. Cog and others in, in trying to um, work with our state, legislator to, uh, state legislature to uh, allocate more money to, to state money towards older Americans. And um, so that number has slightly increased. But what you'll notice here included since 2020 is um, obviously when the pandemic hit, the yellow portion is the federal COVID-19 stimulus dollars. Um, in 2022, the ARPA dollars was roughly twice what we've gotten from the other um, uh, outlays of federal COVID dollars. And so that yellow portion is, has really significantly increased the budget. Um, what's different though with the, with the ARPA money is that money is available until 2024. So unlike the previous years, that money was only available for one year, but uh, this uh, the ARPA money is, is available through the federal fiscal year ending September, 2024. Um, so you'll see in 2020, uh, 2020 to 2022, that black line represents State, state Homestead Act. Um, those are the dollars that are set aside by the state to pay the counties so that they can pay for the rebates that um, older adults may be eligible through their state homestead um, exemption. Uh, there was a lot more money sitting in that, um, that pot than, than was originally uh, uh, or that then was uh, actually um, distributed to the counties. And so that money by statute had to go back into the Older Coloradans Act and so uh, was made available over, um, it, it's roughly $15 million, so $5 million per year to the state. And Dr. Cog's portion of that is roughly $1.2 million from 2020 uh, to 2024, so five years. Um, there's no guarantee we've, we've received the funds um, for the last uh, for the last three years, but there's there's actually really no guarantee that we'll get that in the last two years of that five year um, Homestead Act uh, uh, bill. And uh, you'll also notice in the green section that is the carryover dollar. So again, it's it's you'll you'll see how all of those. Um, different sources of funding have really created to, uh, a, a huge increase in the amounts available for the AAA in 2022. And uh, is, is made for some very uh, sort of challenging times, if you will, in trying to make sure that we're spending all those dollars. So we've done a number of uh, RFPs and so forth. Uh, to try to bring in some new providers, bring in new services, try to pay for um, uh, some uh, capital as well. Uh, but I'll, I'll move forward a bit and, and show you kind of what that COVID-19 stimulus funding um, mix has been since we received our first uh, distribution in 2020. So, it started with the Family First Coronavirus Response Act uh, in 2020. Uh, that same year, we also received uh, the CARES Act dollars that's listed here as Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act. Um, those monies um, in orange have already been spent. So those monies were available um, and, and actually have expired uh, those, those first two bars. Um, we're, we currently have some remaining Consolidated Appropriations Act dollars. Those monies have been fully allocated and will, are expected to be spent by the end of June. Uh, that was 1.1 million that was available um, 
and will expire in September of this year. And then uh, we received a smaller $315,000 for vaccine fund, uh, vaccine promotion. Um, that money has also been, is, is anticipated to be fully spent um, before, by the time they expire in September of this year as well. So pretty much those four, first four columns were anticipating all of that money to be fully uh, spent this year. Um, and then uh, the pending ARPA, of course, as I mentioned, again, we did actually execute that contract. So the 7.9 million has been received and uh, those dollars are available uh, through 2024. So um, that, that's sort of the good news about that funding is that there's a longer time horizon in order to be able to spend those monies. Um, one of the things I've, I've also men mentioned here is that during uh, COVID, we've those dollars due to uh, approval of a federal uh, major disaster declaration. So what that means is that um, we did not have to abide by those specific buckets for how we spend those dollars. So uh, nutrition dollars could be spent to pay for uh, in-home care, for instance, um, as, as long as this disaster declaration was in effect. Of course, we don't know how long that will continue to be the case, but having that additional flexibility to sort of not have to abide by those different federal uh, funding buckets has been um, a lot uh, helpful in terms of uh, distributing those funds. So $16 million uh, roughly is what the, uh, Dr. Cog has received so far. I, um, hopefully that will be it. <laughs> there could be more. There's, uh, there's still talks that there could be additional monies coming down the pipe, but it's $16 million um, in is, is close to what Dr. Cog may have received in total from the Federal Older Americans Act and state dollars. Um, in, in a given year. So that just gives you some perspective of how, um, how um, significant those stimulus dollars have been. And this is to show you how those, uh, the different service contractors that we um, work with to allocate those funds. Some of these providers have been with Dr. Cog since the AAA has been around in over what do you say, jail over 40 years? Um, and uh, like Volunteers of America, and of course, certainly we've, we've added um, several new ones because of um, having um, released different solicitations for uh, service proposals. Uh, we expanded our voucher, our voucher program uh, for in-home care as well as transportation. And so we brought in some additional providers there. Um, so this is, this is our current list of contracted providers, and they provide a whole range of services, um, anywhere from transportation to education, caregiver respite, adult day, um, just a whole slew of, of, um, of services. And this is to show you what those services, current service allocations are. So this is how the monies have been allocated in uh, 2020 through the current year. Um, and so uh, it, it's, I, I guess it's worth noting on the other supportive services, that's kind of a catch all for a number of different services like the counseling and the education. It covers information and assistance. Um, but then you'll see here, um, uh, we, we have uh, obviously nutrition is a very, a uh, large part of our funding and uh, where a lot of the money goes is to pay for sort of those basic needs. So nutrition, food and transportation. Um, and uh, it is also interesting to see just since the pandemic kind of how that mix has changed. Uh, in transportation, you know, in 2020, we, we saw a huge drop off in, in, the, in ridership 
uh, obviously due to, to COVID. And we've had to shift gears and be flexible with our providers and allow them to deliver emergency uh, uh, supplies and food to our um, our older adults and pay for the trips that way. So, um, and we are starting to see uh, the, the the trips rebound. A lot more people are starting to feel more comfortable um, uh, going out and, and, and are calling for, for rides. Uh, nutrition also, you can see it's also continues to be huge. We had experienced obviously uh, with our congregate program, our programs, our dining sites had to close. Some of them open for a little while and then they had to shut down again. And so, um, but we were able to continue to pay for target uh, programs through uh, a grab and go uh, model where um, people could pick up their meals at the congregate sites. Um, or elsewhere and, and count them toward the congregate meal program. So nutrition continues to be a very um, a, a big program and growing program. And as you'll see later on, there are wait lists for nutrition um, and um, especially for in-home services. We have a very high need for in-home care that would include, um, this is the non-medical homemaker personal care type services. It also includes chore programs like the home modification repair type programs um, where we are seeing wait lists. But again, I'll, I'll show you the wait list information in a moment. Um, you'll see our unduplicated client count uh, in the uh, in the corner in the blue box. That that really is is sort of uh, underrepresented because it's really the numbers that we have that are for services where we collect the full demographic data of our clients. We have the rec um, we're required on on specific services to register them within the state's uh, database, and so we collect certain data. Um, and but what it doesn't include is the service, the people that we serve through our um, other programs where we are not required to collect that demo, uh, that specific demographic data. And so that would be like our um, information and assistance services, even our legal assistance where the, those services are reported in aggregate due to um, uh, attorney client privilege. So some services that are reported in aggregate, you, you wouldn't see the unduplicated client uh, figures included. And unduplicated just simply means the number of unique individuals that we are able to track that we've served. And obviously in 2022 through six months, uh, we're on track to sort of, um, to increase the number of people we have two years. Uh, this is the waitlist information that was pulled from December, and our providers in their reporting to us monthly uh, let us know how many people that, that they have on their waitlists, and uh, I've just highlighted a few here um, to point out to you. You'll see home delivered meals that there's currently 366 people on the waitlist um, and roughly uh, uh, two months. Uh, at least two months on that uh, average on that wait list. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the in-home care services, there tends to be, especially during COVID, there's just been more people at home. Um, we believe more people are also um, becoming frail uh, or, you know, we're seeing more frail clients um, needing service. And, uh, but at the same time, we're seeing uh, contraction within that, um, uh, group of our providers where we are losing uh, in-home uh, care providers. So we, what we've done is to, uh, two years ago, we established a voucher program where we went to um, different provider agencies and uh, gave them a, a specific rate that we were willing to pay for service. And so we've been able to bring on some additional um, in-home providers that way. And so through that voucher program, we've been able to um, serve more people, but we still continue to see, as you can see, um, over almost, that number has since increased, that 355 average days on the wait list has increased to over 400 days on the wait list for, um, 
for homemaker and personal care tends to go with that as well. So they're, they tend to have the same sort of um, average days on wait lists because they're served by the same providers. Um, transportation, it's worth noting the number, the large number of people that have been turned away for service. Um, you won't typically see a large wait list in transportation because when people call for service, they need the ride that day or soon after. And if they don't get it, then you know they're, they're counted as unable to serve. Um, so uh, in December, that were, there were 651 people reported as unable to serve for transportation. Um, in January, that number has gone down to closer to 400, but it's still a very significant number. So it's worth mentioning the different challenges that our providers have had to face over the last couple of years, because in, in light of all the funding, they're, they are struggling to even spend their dollars. Um, even with all the additional providers that we've added on, they've just had, they're all uh, to varying degrees experience um, a, a number of challenges. Um, uh, of course, the pandemic related ones are the ones that have impacted their ability to even be open or provide service. Um, as I mentioned, the adult, um, so the uh, congregate dining sites were closed, the adult day centers were closed, um, and even for our transportation providers, um, those that have the large um, 14 passenger vans, they may only be allowed due to space uh, restrictions, um, transport only three or four people at a time, um, on top of the fact that they, you know, there's just all the COVID-19 safety protocols that they've had to abide by. And um, it's just been a, a challenge, of course, the pandemic um, and, and trying to adapt to all of, all of the um, different uh, restrictions and so forth. Um, staffing is a very huge issue, very real issue that I'm sure a lot of you are have heard a lot about just generally um, in, in the market. Um, so we are finding a lot of key positions that have gone unfilled or, or continue to, to go unfilled. Um, and uh, we see huge driver shortages, care workers, um, that are uh, those huge vacancies in, in those particular services. Um, but it's also affecting our, our volunteer pool. Um, a lot of our providers um, that rely on volunteers to provide the service have seen huge drop-offs in their volunteer base as well. Um, and at the same time, they see that, you know, the needs are growing. We've, during COVID, we um, had a lot of providers pivot to, um, uh, providing reassurance uh, calls to their in their homebound clients, and just you, you could see that the needs are 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 very real and grow and increasingly complex, and um, and so there uh, definitely we're seeing that there are definitely needs as evidenced by our wait list of people needing help, and at the same time, as our providers are also losing. Um, are finding that their uh, other sources of funding have been shrinking. They are financially um, uh, constrained uh, uh, and, and, you know, the restricted cash flow and, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's just been a, it's been a challenge and it's, and it's also at the same time, they are challenged to ask for additional funds if the money is only available for one year at a time. So I think, again, that's where the ARPA money is a little bit helpful in that we have a, a little bit more time horizon to know that we can count on that money coming in for um, the next couple of years. But um, that that is a, a concern that we've heard from our providers as far as trying to, um, wanting to build up their staff capacity from this additional funding when potentially there could be that money will get cut off the next year, which is a good segue into talking about the fiscal cliff that we would see um, once those one-time funds do go away. So the one-time funds uh, being the COVID-19 stimulus dollars, the American Rescue Plan Act, that money will expire in September of 2024. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the homestead dollars as well. Um, 
are likely uh, going to end uh, in 2024 as well. And we also do not anticipate that there will be additional flexibility on, the, on, on any carryover so that um, we, we don't anticipate any additional money from, uh, from the federal uh, uh, fund, funds from the previous year. So those are, um, those are concerns. And uh, of course, uh, we will continue to monitor those funds and, and plan for the future. Um, at this point, I'm going to hand it off to Jayla to talk about kind of those thoughts for the future, uh, starting off with kind of how the population is set up to grow over the next, um, you know, several years to decades and what that looks like and the plans from there. So I'll pass it on to you, Jayla. Yeah, you're still going to have to move the slides for me, though. Yep. So all of that, right, that, that fiscal cliff gives me heartburn every time I see it. I've talked to Sharon about this all the time, but um, it, it, we've added new programs, we've added new services in response to the demand, and we're not going to have the money to sustain that unless we do something differently. Um, and the other big push is... Um, th as Sharon said, there, what we're hearing from our service providers and what we're hearing from our staff is that um, cases have gotten more complex and, and older adults have gotten more um, frail. So our, our transportation providers are telling us that there's more wheelchairs, there's more walkers, there's more need to go door through door services, even couch to couch, meaning that, that they need assistance get, getting out of their house into the doctor's office, sat down somewhere, maybe even checked in, uh, and, and that's a higher level of service um, than, than we've seen or, or demand, more people needing that than we've seen. The, the other thing is that our population, as you know, uh, or most of you know, is, is aging rapidly. We are the second fastest aging state in the nation. Um, the top Six cohort, the top fastest growing cohort groups are people over 65. And this is what it looks like. So those folks that are, are, are the oldest tend to have the most needs. We generally start seeing people use our services about 75. So this is the fastest growing cohort, um, followed by the 90 plus. Uh, and so uh, the, the demand for our services are only going to increase. Um, we're right in the middle of, of, this, of this growth. Next slide, please. You can see what it looks like by county, the growth between 2016 and 2050. So this is a little bit further out. But you can see that every single county, the region uh, as a whole grows by 233% um, uh, of the 75 and older. And you can see what that looks like for each of the counties. Next slide, please. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, and there's, there's, it's not much different. Um, this is the year, every four years, every area agency on aging in the country has to do a four-year plan on aging, an area plan on aging. That's this year. Um, for me, getting ready to do it, it will be due uh, this time next year. We'll be doing community services or community assessments, looking at um, gap analysis, uh, uh, community conversations, um, key informant sessions, just trying to figure out where we're at. How has COVID changed the landscape and the need? And what are we going to need to do to per to fill the gaps in services that might exist that we don't know about, and how are we going to prepare uh, for the continuing aging of the population? We're going to have to expand our voucher programs. Uh, this is because our service provider community has been hit hard. So our community, we've had community service providers close their doors. We've had them lose staff. Um, Seniors Resource Center, uh, our partner that had, has been a partner for us in Jefferson County for over 35 years, had to reduce their staff by 80%. Volunteers of America lost 500 volunteers during COVID. 
Um, it is, and, and they're building back, but it is a slow process. And remember, older adults have been particularly vulnerable to COVID. And so they're more resistant of coming back in to serve um, as volunteers or as even staff. Uh, we have to pursue uh, different business opportunities. Um, the, the, federal, uh, the, the federal government, the, uh, uh, community, our federal entity, um, ACL, has been directing us for a while to develop new partnerships, saying your federal dollars and your state dollars are not going to keep pace with the growth of the older population. And so you have to develop new business opportunities. We have done that with the Veterans Administration and others, HICPUF, um, uh, Healthcare Policy and Finance for, for the, with the state. Um, we are partnering with Anthem right now. We need to continue to develop those business opportunities so that we have more funding for services um, in our community. Uh, we have to keep up our advocacy efforts. Remember, I told you we're federally mandated to advocate on behalf of older adults and their caregivers. Um, Senate Bill uh, 290 is an effort uh, to, to increase uh, funding for um, aging sustainability. So, so most of our dollars come for services, a ride, a meal, a visit, um, but it doesn't build capacity. Senate Bill 290 was a bill that happened last year uh, uh, that, that builds in money for capacity building to serve the aging of the population. We hope that that will continue. Um, we also have to do some work at the federal level. There's, uh, there's significant increases for Older Americans Act programs at, in the Build Back Better bill. But as you know, the Build Back Better bill is stalled. So um, and I don't know if it's going to get through or not, that we are advocating that that package, all that hard work that people did um, to put that together, if there's other opportunities to put it in another bill that has more likely chance of, of going through um, and getting passed. That's my number one job is to look for more funding for the next two years um, so that we don't have as big a, a fiscal cliff. Um, and we're going to have to do that with a lot of, we need your ideas. So one of the things that we would like to talk to you about is like, is there anything we could help with this year where we're going to have a surplus of money next year and the following year, not so much, but this year we, we will have some extra money that we could help if you had projects in your region, one-time funding though. Um, or in your area. So um, we would love to hear, it, it doesn't have to be tonight, but it certainly at any time, if you have something that you would like to talk about and see if we could possibly help out with a project that you're doing in your area, we would love to hear about that. Um, and we're gonna just have to keep coordinated about what's, you know, what's going on in the adv advocacy that's gonna be needed in order to uh, re minimize the fiscal cliff, um, if not eliminate the fiscal cliff. So that's, um, is that our last slide, Sharon? Yes. That's, that's our presentation. Be happy to answer any questions or, or um, talk about any particular programs you might be having. Jaylen, thank yeah. you so much. And if anybody has questions, please raise your virtual hand and I'll recognize you. Uh, but Jayla, to you and your staff, thank you for all you do. Uh, you are so valued and, and appreciated and, and we're glad you're here with us always, but especially tonight to give this report. And Sharon, thank you very much. Any questions? I don't see any hands. Melinda, are there hands? Um, I'm not seeing any either. Okay. I, I will jump in to just say, Lisa, um, this might this money might be an opportunity for some of the things that you all are doing in in Arvada. Um, so that would be something we might want to talk about. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, Win Win Shaw. Thank you. Yes, I I just wanted to kind of 
echo the chair's comments about how great a job that you and your staff do, Jayla, and this presentation was helpful. I it 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 amazes me the the work that goes into balancing these funds and not setting up programs that won't be fulfilled and trying to work to spend in the right categories when there have been staffing shortages in some of the transportation uh, companies and home health care and volunteers. I mean, you've been hit from all sides and you <clears throat> Um, have continued to advocate for the aging population in this state and the Dr. Cog region. So uh, I am particularly grateful to you and your staff. <laughs> I wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much. And our, our staff are awesome. Um, they, they had to do a lot of pivoting and a lot of changing and a lot of Sharon and her team had to move money around continuously the last two years to meet the needs, right? There's been so many needs um, and they seem to change every couple of months. And so, uh, yeah, it's been a challenge. And um, I, I look forward to the day when I don't have a COVID meeting in one of my weeks. Uh, it went from <laughs> daily meetings though to now once a week, so that's good. But now I just saw a little article pop up about the AB2 variant of um, Omicron. So, <laughs> I don't know what that means, but I kind of don't want to look at it. <laughs> thank you. Director Levy. Yeah, thank you. And Jayla, I also just want to add my thank you to you and your team for everything you do. I, I know how hard you work and what a huge challenge you have. Um, I did have a question, as you know, from my previous work at CCP, yeah. <laughs> where, um, you know, the uh, legal services, uh, on behalf of older Coloradans is so important for so many reasons. You know, they, they end up with some complex needs and yeah. um, a lot of difficulty taking care of those, whether it's estate work or, or just basic consumer things with, with landlord tenant uh, issues, consumer, you know, debt collection, yeah. things like that. Anyway, and I, you know, I did see that that is a fairly small, you, um, you have a fairly small amount of resources dedicated to that. And I was wondering whether there is flexibility with some of the other funds to um, to fund more legal services. There, uh, we, we've actually tried to do that a couple of times and have not been successful and have reached out um, uh, to uh, other legal service providers uh, in the region and um, right now in particular, and they're saying can't do it. Um, we'd love to, but we don't have the staff to do it. Um, Colorado Legal Services, um, uh, we've been looking because we have the refugee program and we serve, um, uh, we work with a lot of um, uh, attorneys that work on, on citizenship and that's way backlogged, right? And and they wouldn't even, um, they they're just overwhelmed and they can't, um, they haven't been interested in, in, in expanding. Um, we did fund a new legal service provider in, in 2020. And of course, was it 2020 or 2019, Sharon? It was, it was last year for 2021. Yeah. Oh, 2021. And they weren't able to provide much service because it's a pandemic, right? So um, we have been wanting to expand our legal services. I, like you, um, consumer fraud is a, an issue that I would really like to address um, because we hear more and more cases of it all the time. Um, fraud has really increased um, during COVID. Yeah, well, and thanks. And it's, I'm sorry to hear that uh, CLS doesn't have that capacity, but I wonder, you know, we've, we've, we have some law firms that I know of that specialize in elder law, but they're not not for profit. Right. Um, and so I wonder if there is a need if there were some um, reliable funding, not, you know, you can't start a nonprofit if you don't right. have reliable funding, but whether that would be a specialized need. One of the challenges is that fiscal cliff that we're facing, right. Um, and um, if we had the money that we had this year, ooh, life would be wonderful, but we're not going to. And so um, we'll just 
have to see how um, I can tell you those in my time with the AAA as the director, um, we have seen increased uh, need for legal services the entire time, every time we do a four year plan. So I agree with you. Um, there are a lot of must do's in the Older Americans Act. So we'll, we'll see what we can continue to do. And if, um, you know, I may be calling you to say, hey, do you have any ideas? Okay. I'm happy to put my head together with yours, Jayla. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Great. Thank you very much. Again, Jayla and Sharon, thank you so much. Appreciate you being here tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, we will move on to the next item, which is Dr. Cog comments on the Reimagine RTD System Optimization Plan, or SOP. And to speak to us about that, Matthew Heliphant, Senior Transportation Planner. Uh, Mr. Heliphant. And we can't hear you. And we still can't hear you. Cannot hear you. It looks like you're unmuted, but uh, I at least I'm hearing nothing. How about now? There you go. Okay. You. Technology. You gotta love it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everybody. Um, Matthew Helfand, a senior transportation planner at Dr. Cog. Uh, so at your uh, board meeting last month, Bill Van Meter from RTD uh, presented to you on Reimagine RTD, which is an effort evaluating and forecasting the changing transportation needs of our region. Key component of Reimagine RTD is the System Optimization Plan, or SOP. Uh, the SOP includes recommendations for service redesign and um, a route-by-route -route guide for service development between uh, late this year and uh, 2027. As part of this effort, RTD seeks uh, to incorporate stakeholder and community feedback on how to allocate their resources. Public comments on the, on the draft SOP are due uh, very soon, uh, March 9th. Also at, at the last board meeting, members of this body indicated an interest in providing comments to RTD on the draft SOP. Key topics of, of the, um, of the um, key, key topics that the uh, Dr. Cog Board of Directors may want to consider today informing potential uh, input include uh, a, uh, service area challenge, which is really covered throughout the RTD system, the, the, the balance between uh, coverage and, and frequency, and B, um, service performance and efficiency, uh, one seat rides versus efficient transfers. Dr. Cog uh, staff have uh, drafted possible uh, board comments based on previous discussions that we've heard on these topics to serve as a starting point for discussion. So uh, first, um, ad addressing the service area challenge. Under the draft SOP, some transit service has been reduced in areas outside the urban core compared to pre-pandemic service levels. Uh, many of these areas contain equity populations, including low-income households and individuals with disabilities, among many others. And these populations are more likely to depend on transit access for employment and other opportunities throughout the region. RTD should guard against tilting the balance too far toward uh, service cost effectiveness through a ridership lens. Uh, the SOP should be adjusted to enhance coverage, especially to improve mobility for disadvantaged communities uh, inside the, the RTD boundaries that have limited or no service. And secondly, uh, addressing service performance and efficiency. Uh, much of RTD's service has historically been oriented toward commuting uh, to downtown Denver. And that orientation results in many long one seat ride routes with benefits to commuters uh, going to jobs in the urban core. The trade-offs are twofold. First, long routes often reduce on-time performance, making the service less reliable. And secondly, 
this type of orientation makes less accessible. And RTD should consider orienting more transit services toward uh, efficient and frequent transfer opportunities, shorter routes that are more reliable and provide access to more destinations throughout the region. And, and every, think, so just very briefly to everyone, those statements are in your packet if you want yes. to take a look at those as well. Go ahead, and, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no problem at all, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I, I, I have one slide that just says, uh, that, that, that summarizes that just to put up as a visual cue uh, to start the conversation. So I will share my screen and do that. One moment. There we go. So happy to take any questions. There's also a bunch of people back here um, uh, that can also take questions and um, uh, anything you need to, to, for your conversation. Director Levy, please. Thank you. Um, I just put in the chat a document, I, I hope I put it in the chat, um, that it's the comments that the Northwest Mayors and Commissioners Coalition uh, sent to RTD with, with our comments on the SOP. And, um, and I thought there might be some things in those comments that we, that we would want to emphasize as well. Um, it, a lot of these are really tailored towards service in the Northwest area, um, but some of them are much more general. And so um, I, I'm not gonna read through that here for you, but, but assuming it's, it can be opened, I think that- It's that, there. Yep. Yeah, there might be some food for thought. I guess a couple of things that I would highlight in there. Uh, one is we think it, it was a major oversight not to um, and analyze the SOP through the lens of greenhouse gas reductions or environmental impacts given that we have just spent all this time on a greenhouse gas reduction rule for the transportation sector, a large part of which is assuming we're going to um, shift a lot of single occupancy vehicles into transit. And uh, I think they need to, RTD needs to be looking at, um, at whether the service reductions or the shifts in service that they're contemplating are gonna be consonant with that or not. Um, so I, that's that's something that is is really not geographically focused. Another is the way in which they are doing their um, equity analysis, their Title VI analysis. It doesn't appear that it's looking at it's looking at where um, equity, so-called equity populations live. Um, and not also looking at the, the places to which people um, who are transit dependent go to take to, for jobs or for medical appointments or, or other services, um, shopping. So, um, you know, I, I think there are some um, analytical things that we should ask Dr. Cog to do in those two areas. And, and then, you know, there may, be, there may be corresponding examples from some of these other things um, that we put in here that from other areas in the, um, in the Denver metro area. That the last one I'll call out on that front is just that we in Boulder County have been doing all this work on our Northwest area mobility studies uh, and designing corridors uh, with BRT in mind. And it does not look as if their service optimization plans are taking those into account. And so that's something we commented on in Boulder County, but there may be other similar planning efforts in other parts of Dr. Cog that aren't really being accounted for in this SOP. Great, thank you, Director. Board Chair Flynn. 
Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I see uh, Doug Monroe in the attendees. I don't know if you'd want to chime in on this, but uh, Matthew, could you, in your estimation, has RTD, um, I recall they, there used to be a calculation they could do or a projection that every time you uh, have a transfer, you lose X percent of riders. Uh, and, uh, and I'm also interested in whether you believe they have made an adequate analysis of the impact on ridership, not ridership, I'm sorry, on staffing needs uh, when you go to shorter routes, more frequent routes, uh, what does that do to cost per rider uh, uh, by doing that? But I'm, I'm mostly interested in the, uh, the impact of, of forcing transfers. Just anecdotally, I used to take the, the light rail from Englewood to downtown all the time on the D-line uh, to go to city council. And I, there was a period where the D-line was uh, during the midday was uh, reduced or might even, maybe even eliminated. So I had to take the C-line and then wait for a transfer of Broadway uh, to get into downtown. I ended up driving. And so I, I know that that phenomenon is, is something that's real. Uh, have, has RTD adequately accounted for that? And I don't know if Doug would wanna chime in on it. Thanks. So you are correct. I mean, there is what, what's called a transfer penalty um, that you know certainly uh, makes transit less attractive when when that situation is introduced. Um, I don't know if there's. I, I'm I'm not aware of any uh, you know calculation or rule of thumb or anything like that that uh, you know adding a transfer reduces ridership by X amount or anything like that. But there there is some. Uh, some loss of ridership because of it. Um, I would say, you know, as, as far as the SOP, um, it, it's a balancing act as, uh, you know, trying to provide as much service and as much attractive service as we can um, in, in uh, with, with the resources that we have. You bring up the situation with the C and the D line um, and with, uh, with, our ridership uh, projections, and uh, you know where where we expect to be within the next five years. Here, um, ridership doesn't necessarily make sense to run both of those services frequently along the Southwest Corridor. Um, so it's a matter of you know do you run both of those services infrequently, and of course you lose passengers by operating infrequent service in that regard. Um, but as you said as well, you know introducing the transfers uh, also reduces passenger. So it's, it's, you know, trying to provide uh, the best service that we can with the, the resources that we have. Um, to your other point about uh, splitting routes and what that, uh, what that does with workforce, um, that is another, uh, that, that is something that impacts workforce um, and it probably will require uh, more operators to operate the same uh, amount of service along those corridors. Um, but at the same time, you're gaining the reliability by having the shorter route. Um, I don't think I don't think we have an exact calculation uh, on how many uh, how many operate how many extra operators it's taking to operate that. But the the system optimization plan as a whole uh, requires somewhere in the neighborhood of about 400 more operators than RTD currently has, um, and we're already about 150 short of our current service. Uh, you know, yeah. where ideally we'd like to be for the service that we're operating today. So. Uh, it is a, a major consideration in any of this, uh, any of in any of this uh, plans that we're putting forward here. Certainly. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that, Doug. Uh, Matthew, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. Also. No. I uh, just want to thank Doug and provide RTD's um, uh, background mm -hmm. on that topic. Thank you, uh, Director Saltman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just want to emphasize the points um, that Director Levy made. I would support adding those points to the letter and then just add a couple others. Um, one other comment that we made at the Northwest MCC when we were looking at it is around just service frequency and just really highlighting that point around um, if there is an adequate frequency that people really will not take um, transit because it, it, it's not present for them. And the last point um, that I don't think that she talked about, but I think is really important is that 
the system optimization plan doesn't really look at sources of funding and how they are required to be expended. So uh, within RTD, we often um, struggle because there are different taxes and they have different purposes. Um, so like the fast tracks tax is supposed to provide service and repay capital and capital solutions within the fast track system. And the base tax is for base system things. And then, you know, there are fees and then there are direct federal grants and there are um, grants based on specific populations within the region. And so to just look at this and not consider the requirements associated with the different funding sources and separate those out and look at things from that perspective seems like there's a hole and that it will lead to um, continued uh, concern around funding equity that we that we hear about. So uh, I think it's a I think there needs to be more work done on looking at the sources and uses of funding and whether they're meeting the regulatory requirements. Great, thank you very much, uh, Director Moley. Good evening. Hi. Good evening. Um, I want to thank all uh, everybody else for the comments. You know, um, down in Douglas County, we don't have a ton of. RTD service and not all of our um, municipalities are members and the concept of um, equity is not always um, borne out in the commonly discussed methods and so when Director Levy mentions the letter I'd really like to take a solid look at it and when Director Stoltzman mentions it as well the disparity in funding mechanisms and whether or not the services present that, that really comes to bear in an area where there is lesser service and so that's very meaningful to me so i'd like an opportunity before we finalize anything to really take a solid look at what director levy offered because i think that might have broader reach and application there was one comment i think it was direct uh, chair director flynn about what whether or not the service is present um and we have a great um area in the south where there's a lot of regions where it's not present and then i'd also like to give a shout out to the person who had what in the northeast sounded a lot like a, a path train <laughs> and a bus signal so i don't know about all you that don't that do or don't use rtd and other um, methods of light rail but that ding dong was very familiar to me a frequent user of transit so shout out <laughs> whoever it was <laughs> Thank you, Director. Director Spear. Thank you. Um, I was just uh, really curious about the degree to which um, some of the outreach and engagement is um, working specifically to engage uh, lower income communities and others who may be most impacted by um, some of these service changes and um, kind of what what I'm thinking about, you know, specifically with regard to um, the Northwest corridor is, you know, we've got a lot of um, kind of wealthier folks around here, but a lot of lower income people are taking the bus in. And my understanding is that, you know, the way that um, impacts have been addressed is really thinking about the people who live in the communities versus the people who are kind of traveling to some of these places for work. And so um, I'm, I'm just curious about whether there are specific efforts to engage with these communities and try to get feedback because it's not these aren't always the easiest groups to, um, you know, connect with if you have somebody who's working two or three jobs or you know has young children or something like that great thank you very much uh director Odoricio. can't hear you and now we can't see you either <laughs> can you can you see me and hear me now there you go all right thank you very much um i appreciate it. this is my first time using zoom ever i'm joking um the uh <laughs> Uh, no, I think that the comments that you bring up in these two different areas about service uh, area challenges and then efficiency and performance are important. I think it's, um, I think it's important to remember that the folks outside of that core urban area are just don't have a lot of the infrastructure uh, that helps us build um, some of that ridership. And focusing a lot on ridership, uh, what happens is it'll it'll just exacerbate the have the 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 gap between the haves and the have-nots. Those who have had a lot of the density. Those who have had a lot of the uh, transit infrastructure investments in the past are always going to then continue to be uh, have be at a greater advantage than the others who haven't had some of that investment. And it likely also, like, so what I'm concerned about is that we keep that equity lens and remember that we're never going to get 
more ridership in those areas unless we make it easier for people to participate. I mean, I live in Adams County and we're very proud of our blue collar roots. People get up here, they fill their lunch pail, grab their tool belt and they're in a truck. And a lot of them are out there around the entire metro area fixing our houses. Uh, maybe they're helping grow our food, pick it, pack it, ship it, serve it, uh, deliver it. I mean, that's what a lot of the folks in my community, and they just can't do that on a bus. Uh, others are in a situation where they wake up, they uh, are struggling to get those damn kids ready for school. They take those kids, throw them in a car, drop them off at school, then drive once to their work, uh, stop somewhere at, a, at the uh, grocery store on the way home, pick up the kids, take them to practice and bring them home. Well, it's nice for us to talk about how great it is to have all this transit and all these other things everywhere. Sometimes that person who sits at home and gets 15 things de delivered to them a day, including their food and their stuff, is probably creating a greater impact on the community than that mom and father who are out driving their kids around uh, with one big loop throughout the whole day. I just want us to keep the perspective that we have very disparate communities and that we don't allow systemic biases to be built in that just exacerbates the haves and the have nots in infrastructure. So let's just keep that in mind that we all are in this together. Let's absolutely try to reduce greenhouse gases. Let's try to increase transit, but that also includes opportunities uh, for transit need to be included in these discussions. Director Odoricia, thank you very much. Very well said. Uh, Ron Papsdorf, Dr. Cox's staff. Ron? Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, members of the board. I maybe I just wanted to kind of wrap up a few things. Um, I will I will say we really appreciate all of this, all of the discussion here and this feedback and these comments. I think you all have hit on sort of various aspects of the conflicts that are inherent in these decisions and in the system optimization plan. Um, RTD can, with with optimizing the current system within current resources, they could focus all those resources on maximizing cost effectiveness and ridership and frequency. But that means there would be huge swaths of this region that had no transit service whatsoever. Um, or RTD could sort of spread those resources um, pretty evenly around the region to make sure every neighborhood had some transit access. And that would mean very, very limited um, or no sort of real frequent service that provided sort of uh, uh, origin to destination trips and, and was very cost effective. Um, and that's the conundrum that we're facing as a region um, in the current situation. And um, I will tell you, the board scared me um, at the last board meeting when you asked us to bring back some suggested comments um, high level on the SOP for you to consider um, with, within a very short period and a week before the comment deadline. And we have intentionally crafted these to try to sort of find a balance and highlight sort of those choices um, in these two suggested comments. And um, I think if the board is interested in going further or commenting on more, I would suggest that maybe the board uh, might want to direct the uh, or authorize the executive committee to finalize comments um, on the SOP to submit to RTP or to RTD. Um, that might be one way to approach this, um, but I would, I, as your as your staff, I certainly would um, suggest that there are a number of these comments that are really about sort of how do we build from today? How do we build on the SOP towards um, building out, I think, what we all want, and that is um, implementing the RTP and the bus rapid transit network for the region, improving transit service. Um, this SOP is not going to solve our greenhouse gas emission standards. If you recall back to the greenhouse gas rule, um, the, the analysis from CDOT at the time was basically doubling transit service in this region um, to sort of have an impact on reducing greenhouse gas emissions for the region. This SOP doesn't do that. Um, and, and this SOP can't do that. There just aren't the resources to double transit service right now. Um, but we should be thinking about um, and I think our suggested comments to you have reflected on sort of really thinking about equity um, and, and suggesting to RTD, they, re they rethink that and take that into consideration. So um, I guess those are my high level comments and the, the suggestion might be if the board is so inclined and wants to get comments into RTD before the, uh, the March 9th deadline is to maybe uh, task the executive committee to refine the comments uh, for submission on behalf of the board. Thank you. Treasurer Odoricio, you're back. 
So, so if that's the question is, do we support that? I, I could tell you I support it if you include things like the comments that you placed in the agenda about making sure that you're covering those uh, reduction of, of outside areas outside of the urban core and that we're not just focusing on uh, ridership to and from only downtown and that you, you know, you include all those things that you included in the agenda. If you if you're going to stick true to that, then I would support it. With the two draft statements, does this group, you know, consensus uh, without us taking a, a vote or any of those type of things, just our consensus, do we agree with those two statements fundamentally that they provided uh, as, as kind of a starting point of comments if we are to provide those to, to RTD? Any disagreement with those two comments? Okay. Um, and I think we heard some other thoughts. Uh, you know, one thing that, that when I talk to people about RTD, the two words that, that people say they want are predictability and reliability. Uh, and so with whatever, those two things I think may come before a lot of the other uh, building of ridership and some of those things. Director Shaw. And to those two things you said, I would add safety. So, uh, you know, it still goes back to making very, very tough decisions. Um, uh, again, there is a quandary. Is mm -hmm. coverage or frequency better? And both is the answer, but we're not going to get both. I think that's part of what, what I'm feeling um, and maybe other members of the board as well. But, but maybe you're right to, to just kind of say, you know, um, Frequency, reliability, safety. Thanks. And direct, Director Stoltzman added in fair rate as one of those issues as well in comments. So uh, is there a consensus of the executive committee as director or uh, Ron Papstorff suggested? Uh, does that make sense as a strategy? Uh, is this group's inclination still wanting Dr. Cog to provide feedback by that deadline? And, and if so, are you comfortable with that uh, being worked on by staff and the executive committee? Director Mulvey. I'm in agreement with the changes as well. I think all of the comments pertain to the entire region and reflect that we have differing um, profiles in our communities. And I, I think that's part of why our feedback, our comments need to be as broad and as wide as they can and keeping that in mind. And I appreciate the fact that this conversation didn't get deep in the weeds about specific issues in specific areas, because obviously that would be something very difficult for us to cover that, that sort of feedback. Uh, Director Levy says she's covered with staff taking the comments and writing them up. Uh, Director Moby, your hand is still up. Did you have more? No, thank you. It was a sent. Okay. And um, I too am comfortable with staff synthesizing it. Okay. I am not hearing objection to that. And in the interest of time, uh, I will take that to be consensus of that direction. Uh, Mr. Papstorff and Mr. Rex, are we comfortable with that? Does that give you enough to go on at this point? With okay, thank, thank you very much. much. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mr. Helpett. Any final comments? Don't want to, to cut you out of the conversation. We kind of went off on our comments. For Mr. Oh, Felton, uh, oh, uh, just thank you for the conversation, and we're we're happy to help. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Awesome. We will move on on the agenda to our next item, which is discussion of the 2022 board retreat, an update from Executive Director Doug Rex. Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And this will be this will be short. I just wanted to put a plug in for our upcoming uh, board retreat on April 2nd. This is Saturday. We typically, as you know, um, well, at least for the board members that have been around a while, we usually do this off site, but due to some of the complications and uh, COVID, we decided to it would probably be safer 
to uh, to do it at our place where we control the environment and the like. So um, we're very excited about this opportunity. It's all about re-engagement for us. We're so excited to see you folks in person. Um, we know that we probably have 30, 40% of our board that are new, right? That quite frankly, had never had an opportunity to meet uh, the, 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 uh, the existing board members. So we're we're excited about that opportunity. I, the, the agenda is coming together well. We're gonna have a conversation with Performance and Engagement Committee at 5.30 tonight um, about the agenda and finalizing that. But we, we anticipate that that agenda will, uh, uh, will in part in the morning, will involve a conversation about um, uh, a five-year strategic plan for the agency is something that staff has uh, been discussing internally for the last uh, several months that we have an interest in doing it. We've, we've never done that type of exercise at Dr. Cog, so we're excited about it. So we want to share with you some of uh, some possible new initiatives that the agency might take on that we believe will have collective value for our member local governments. And uh, so we just want set off you as kind of our first salvo with regards to you know what that looks like as part of a, a strategic plan so and then in the afternoon um it is it is our anticipation right now that we'll focus most of our attention on um on housing um in this region and um you know what that means as doc for dr cog and our role in 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 the in the housing world so we want to have that conversation with you we're going to do what we're calling a question storming activity with you all to try to get all uh, all the questions that you might have related to housing on the table and then uh, at a later date we'll bring forth some answers and hopefully that'll provide some direction for all of us as to uh, how Dr. Cox should be involved. So I'll just leave it there Mr. Mr. Chairman. I, I will tell you that the um, so uh, the workshop itself will begin at about eight o'clock with breakfast and conclude at five. Um, the formal activities will end around 3.30 or so. We're planning on having a little social uh, hour or two um, with, with you all upstairs on our seventh floor um, in our high noon uh, area, which we, which we have up there and, and uh, just for an opportunity for you all to socialize and, and uh, re-engage. So thank you, sir, very much. Appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. I have two more things before we adjourn. Uh, want to welcome a new member. I know we have at least one new member on the call tonight. Uh, Idaho Springs Mayor Chuck Harmon. Chuck, welcome. Oh. Glad to have you here. Thank you for being here. And, Thank you very much. Absolutely. Uh, and then a bit of trivia for all of you. Uh, my background is in radio and I want to share this. I shared it with the exec committee a little while ago. Next Thursday, the 10th of March, is the 100th anniversary of, of licensed radio coming to Colorado. Uh, the city of Denver got it and the Denver metro area got its first licensed radio station 100 years ago next week. And that was KLZ put on the air by Doc Reynolds, who is a dentist that had moved to Colorado, started in the Springs, then moved to Denver, put his uh, radio station on the air from a house over near DU, uh, and the rest is history. So just thought I would share. You can act really smart uh, next week when you tell people it's the 100th anniversary of radio in uh, Colorado. With that, any other matters for the good of the order? Anyone else? Fantastic. With that, we will adjourn. Thank you all very much for being here tonight. We appreciate it. Have a good night. Good night. PE starts in Thank eight you. minutes. <laughs> Thank you.